What you most want to find will be found where you least want to look. There's this old story that's from King Arthur, and King Arthur has these knights, right? They all sit around a round table, which means they're roughly equal. That's what the round table means. And they're off to find the Holy Grail, and the Holy Grail is the most valuable object. That's what it means. So they're off to find the most valuable thing, but they don't know what it is, and they don't know where it is. But they know that there's a most valuable thing, so in some sense it's akin to them orienting themselves by the star. And they don't know where to look, and so what they decide is they have the castle, and it's the middle of a forest, and so each knight decides to start looking for the Holy Grail by entering the forest at the point that looks darkest to him. And so what's the idea there? Well, imagine there are things that come easy to you, and that you're fond of pursuing, and that you're happy about pursuing, so you've found those and pursued them, and you've mastered them. So you know all that, but then there's another place that you don't want to go. And so you haven't gone there, and you haven't mastered it, and you're very small in comparison to it because you haven't mastered it, and so it has this monstrous aspect. If what you're doing isn't working, it's where you haven't gone that you need to go. And so, I can give you another example of this. So let's say you're an agreeable person. And so, you don't like conflict and you won't stand up for yourself. And you regard anger and the proclivity to provoke and to engage in conflict as something that's positively terrible. It's not only that you're not good at it, it's actually that it's wrong. So that's where you have to go if you're going to learn how to stand up for yourself. And imagine that you're afraid. Maybe you have something like agoraphobia. And so there's a whole bunch of things that you're afraid of, and you don't want to go there. But if you want to put yourself together, then that's exactly where you have to go. And so it's frequently the case that what you want to find is to be found where you least want to find it. And that idea is echoed in the prominent stories of dragons and gold. It's exactly the same idea. The dragon is this terrible thing, it's this terrible predatory thing that lives forever and is very, very wise. And it lives underground, and it'll kill you, it'll burn you up in a second. But it hoards gold. And so you have to go there into the dragon's lair if you're going to get the gold. And that's a representation of people's paradoxical relationship with reality. It's like, you have to go out there and confront it in order to incorporate what it has to offer to you. But the probability that that's going to be intensely dangerous and push you right to the limit, first of all, those are actually the same thing. If it didn't push you to the limit, you wouldn't gain anything valuable from it. So, you don't get one without the other. You don't get the gold without the dragon. That's a very strange, very, very strange idea. But it seems to be accurate. So all of that's lurking underneath this, in this imagery of the whale. Now, the whale, you can think of the story of Jonah. What happens with Jonah is that, roughly speaking, he's a prophet. And God tells him that he has to go to this city and straighten it out because it's veered off the path and it's heading towards doom. And Jonah thinks, I'm not going to that city to tell those people anything like that because they're not going to be very happy with me just showing up there and telling them, you know, everything they're doing wrong. And so he hops on a boat and tries to get out of there. And then God conjures up this huge storm and the boat is about to be swamped. And Jonah admits that it's actually his fault because God's upset with him because he got this direct command to go straighten out the city and he ran off. And so they're not happy about this, but they throw Jonah overboard and the seas calm and a great fish comes up, a whale, and swallows him. And then he's down in the fish for three days and it throws him up on the dry land and then he's learned his lesson by that time and he goes off to pursue his proper destiny. So that's echoed in this story as well, that if you don't follow the pathway that you're supposed to follow, the seas will become stormy for you, and something will come up and pull you down, and you'll be in a terrible place for some length of time till you learn your lesson. And if you're lucky, you'll get spit back up on shore, and then you can go do what you should do. Well, I mean, that's not a lesson that anybody needs to have interpreted. I think everybody understands that. Anyways, the cricket tells Pinocchio what he has to do. And then something kind of paradoxical happens. Pinocchio decides he's going to go do this. And then the cricket has got this weird paradoxical response to that. On the one hand, he's, he's sort of pulling Pinocchio back, saying, look, you know, this is foolhardy. 
you're going to go all the way down to the ocean, you're going to confront this terrible whale, this is really, really dangerous. But at the same time, when Pinocchio is on the edge of the cliff, the cricket helps him tie his tail around a rock and he, he holds his finger in place so that Pinocchio can tie the knot. It's like the conscience is conflicted about this. It's really dangerous and foolhardy, but it's also necessary. And so he plays this dual role, but Pinocchio is leading at this point, so into the ocean he goes. I guess partly what this means is that if you're not oriented properly in the world, you should take your doubts and the chaos that you're enveloped in seriously. You should face it and think it through. You should go into it as far as you can go into it, because maybe you'll find something at the bottom of it. I mean, the alternative is to pretend that it doesn't exist.